crimson. I'm heading out. Hmm? You going somewhere? Yeah, I just got a job. Some guy needs some help with some adventure. I don't know, I wasn't paying attention. I'm really just playing a tour guide. You gonna be okay here? Ah. Rings. Katana. And bait. I've got everything I need. Cool, cool, all right. I'm sorry I can't stay and help, but this guy's paying me double since he booked me last minute. I'll be back in a week. Don't do anything too reckless. All right, let's set up a trap. We all had that one book series that defined our childhood. You know what I'm talking about. That series you could never get enough of. The one that made you wish you could literally travel alongside the characters of the story. The series that helped mold who you were in those early years. Or if you didn't have a series like that, I'm sorry, but your childhood probably sucked. I'm talking about series like The Hardy Boys, The Babysitter's Club, Nancy Drew, Ghost Bumps, The Happy Hollisters, or whatever you were into. The list goes on and on. But in my case, no book series quite defines my childhood quite like The Adventures of Tintin. Tintin first appeared on January 10th, 1929 in the French newspaper Le Petit Vingtième, and eventually wound up in his own magazine. Tintin was created by Belgian cartoonist Georges Remy, writing under the pseudonym Hergé. The series is about a young Belgian reporter named Tintin, who's accompanied by his faithful dog Snowy and several friends such as the daring, though alcoholic, Captain Archibald Haddock, the brilliant but mostly deaf Professor Cuthbert Calculus, and the loyal but bungling detectives Thompson and Thompson. Tintin traveled all over the world, solving mysteries and stopping various crimes, almost like a version of Indiana Jones for kids. In 1991, Tintin was turned into a popular cartoon, which eventually aired in over 50 countries. In fact, you're listening to the theme song now. Catchy, isn't it? The movie is based on the books The Crab with the Golden Claws and The Secret of the Unicorn. The movie is a solid combination of the two, using the former to introduce the characters and using the latter to set up the overall plot. Apparently, director Steven Spielberg has been an avid fan of Tintin ever since a review compared Raiders of the Lost Ark to The Belgian Reporter. Likewise, Hergé was a fan of Spielberg. Hergé didn't like the four live-action adaptations of Tintin that had been attempted, or the stop-motion puppet movie made in 1947, and thought Spielberg was the only person who could do Tintin justice. Sadly, Hergé died in 1983, well before Spielberg could ever make the Tintin movie both creators wanted. Well enough, there's a friendly little nod to Hergé in today's movie, but we'll get to that later. Tintin and the Secret of the Unicorn finally came out in 2011 and was a massive success, with Jamie Bell voicing the titular character. Starting with a production budget of $135 million, the movie turned around and more than doubled their investment, ending with $374 million in the box office. If I haven't made enough of a case for it yet, this movie is good. Like, real good. Good enough that if you haven't seen it, you should stop watching this review right now, go watch the movie for yourself, then come back, because I'm going to spoil so many things here. Don't worry, we'll wait for your return. And now, for those of us who have seen the movie, or for those of us who are too lazy or impatient to stop this review, this is Tintin, Secret of the Unicorn. So the movie starts off with a very stylized intro, giving us an idea of who Tintin is and what kind of life he leads. We also see that this movie has three writers, Edgar Wright, Joe Cornish, and... <laughs> oh god, Stephen Moffat! Don't fall in love with any of the characters, they'll just get killed! Okay, do you remember that friendly nod to Hergé I mentioned before? Very nearly there, sir. I have to say, your face is familiar. Have I drawn you before? As the movie starts for real, we meet Tintin as he's being drawn by a street artist. But the really cool thing is that the artist bears a striking resemblance to Hergé himself. This is actually a clever joke, since Hergé was drawn into several episodes of The Adventures of Tintin, with roles ranging from random bystander to member of the royal court. 
It's not just that Hergé was included at the very start of the movie, but he's first seen drawing Tintin, even using the same clear line style that Hergé was famous for. It's almost like Spielberg was acknowledging an old friend by saying, this all started with you. A very touching moment from the film crew. Class act, guys. There. I believe I have captured something of your likeness. Ah. Not bad. What do you think, Snowy? So we get our first look at Tintin, and, well, I guess I should go over the Uncanny Valley. The Uncanny Valley is the phenomenon that describes the sense of unease or even revulsion when looking at an image or object that's supposed to look human, but somehow just isn't. There's a point, as seen on this graph, where something looks almost human but doesn't quite reach over that final hurdle and just becomes difficult to look at. Examples would be robots with skin, badly CGI'd characters, Nicki Minaj, and to some people, Tintin in this movie. Now, I've personally never really had a problem with Tintin's appearance, although some critics apparently do. I think his image matches the world around him, is detailed enough, and is given a wide range of facial expressions so that any discovery you feel doesn't last beyond a few minutes. Plus, he doesn't have the same dead, soulless eyes as a robot or a creepy doll. Or a Kardashian. Of course, I'm coming at this bias as fuck, so you can probably take some of what I'm saying with a grain of salt. Tintin wanders about the market for a bit more when he spies a model ship that he rather likes. Triple masted, double decks, 50 guns. Oh, isn't she a beauty? That's a very unique specimen, that is, from an old sea captain's estate. One of Tintin's greatest qualities wasn't just that he was brave and able, but he was also very knowledgeable. The unicorn. Unicorn. Man of war sailing ship. Oh. It's very old, that is. 16th century. 17th, I would think. Reign of Charles the First. Charles the Second. That's what I said, Charles the Second. As fine a ship as ever sailed the seven seas. You won't find another one of these, mate. Again, it comes down to the smart explorer character type that made him so much fun to read about, and the movie does a good job bringing that to life as well. The movie shows him collecting clues and figuring out his next steps from there, like he was building a puzzle as the mystery unfolded. He buys the model, but seconds later gains the attention of that guy with the glasses. This is that guy with the glasses saying, there's no such thing as a stupid question until you ask it. Oh, wait, no. I'm wrong. This is actually Ivan Ivanovich Sakharin, and he's voiced by Daniel Craig. Sakharin is also interested in the model ship, but Tintin isn't willing to part with it, having already bought it. However, like that guy with the glasses, Sakharin here is our movie's antagonist. He's not an evil villain, he's selfish and cunning, but charming when he needs to be. Dare I say, a bit sweet? Oh come on, saccharin, sweet, I had to get at least one in. I'm sorry, but as I told you before, it's not for sale. Good day to you, sir. Now, the only real difference between this scene and the one from the book is motivation. In the book, Tintin bought this for his naval friend, Captain Haddock, but Spielberg wanted to give this story a fresh start for newcomers. He couldn't just bring in Haddock and Tintin's friendship and give this franchise the rich, character-driven finesse that the books are famous for, so here, Tintin is just buying the ship for himself. And Spielberg was right to do this. By introducing Tintin and Haddock one at a time so that the audience can see their friendship being built, we have an example of show, don't tell, and we don't have to play catch-up to see what kind of friends they make. So Tintin takes the model home and puts it on display, but a cat sneaks into his flat and, as is often the case, chaos ensues. Look what you did. You broke it. However, Tintin doesn't notice a small cylinder pop out of the center mass and fall under his table. This is important. However, given the attention that the model received earlier, Tintin decides that a little research is in order. And where's the one place you go when you have to look something up? Everyone say it with me now. The, the internet! internet! No, no, wait, this was set in the 1940s. Oh. <clears throat> the, the library! library. Tintin discovers that the original unicorn that the model was based on had a ruinous voyage and was attacked by pirates and sunk. Only one man made it out alive, the Unicorn's captain, Sir Francis Haddock, who later believed that his family's name had been cursed. It seems that Tintin has once again stumbled into a mystery. See, this old school charm is another reason why Tintin was so great. Maybe I'm old fashioned, but mysteries today just seem way too easy, like you can solve everything with a Google search off your smartphone. 
The owner of this amusement park says a ghost is scaring away all his customers. My plan is we split up. You are incompetent. Huh? The owner of this park is bankrupt. These are his financial records. Don't implicate me in whatever you're doing. Lots of honest people file Chapter 11, Lisbeth. Here are his personal emails. He has $50,000 in gambling debt. Well, then again, I'm one of the few people left on the planet who isn't bothered that he owns a flip phone. Look, it flips! Characters like Tintin have to memorize facts and use deductive reasoning and situational awareness. You can't just hit a button and have your answers all in one place. Here are receipts for a ghost costume, a one-way ticket to Brazil, and 12 drums of acetone, the most common arson accelerant. He is planning to burn the park for the insurance money, blame it on a ghost, and flee the country. I'm likely overplaying how technology-dependent modern-day mysteries are, but to me, there's no better mystery than an old soft-boiled story that had characters hopping from one country to the next. You can probably thank Carmen Sandiego for that one as well. The plot rears its ugly head as Tintin returns home. I've missed something, Snowy. We need to take a closer look at that model. Of course it's gone! Tintin already suspects Saccharin, who was rather persistent in getting the model. Fortunately, Saccharin showed his hand when he introduced himself. I have recently acquired Marlin Spike Hall, and this ship, as I'm sure you're aware, was once part of the estate. So, Tintin starts his investigation there. It seems we've caught a thief. It doesn't start well. Saccharin and his butler, Nestor, run into Tintin before the reporter can make off with the model ship he discovers, but there is one little problem. There's no mistake. It belongs to me. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I took it home, I put it on the cabinets in the living room, and then Snowy chased the cat and knocked it over, and it... fell. This isn't my ship. There are two model ships. The mystery deepens as Tintin's investigation circles around what happened on the original unicorn. But when he gets home again... <sighs> Great snakes! Tintin's flat was ransacked, but the burglars missed the one thing they were looking for. The cylinder from the model ship. And inside was a scroll. Three brothers joined. Three unicorns in company. Sailing in the noonday sun will speak. For it is from the light. That light will dawn. And then shines forth the eagle's cross. Tintin calls in his friends from the police, the bumbling Thompson and Thompson, played by Nick Frost and Simon Pegg respectively. Because their characters are so different. Does that mean anything to you? Great Scotland Yard! Oh, that's extraordinary! What is? Worthington's ever half price sale on bowler hats. Really, Thompson? This is hardly the time. Great Scotland Yard! What is it? Cade's a half price too? Are you going to take charge of this evidence? Casting Frost and Pegg to play off each other was a great move. Not only do they sound very similar, but they have a history of playing off each other well, something that comes across even in their voice acting. I'm not sure how necessary it was to have two voice actors since these characters are basically the same person, but Peg and Frost pull it off. Quite frankly, everyone brought their A-game to this movie. Also, these two are on the hunt for a pickpocket, of whom Tintin quickly becomes a victim. This problem is made worse by the fact that Tintin stuffed his scroll in his wallet, thus losing the only clue he had to solving a 300-year-old mystery. As Tintin slumps home, he's interrupted by an unexpected package arriving at his door. Mr. Tin. Tin. Yes? Delivery for you. But I didn't order anything. Well, well that's because he's you! It's getting delivered! <laughs> Tintin is captured and taken to a ship in port called the Caraboujan, where Saccharin has engineered a mutiny and taken over as captain. And he wants only one thing. Have you found it? He doesn't have it! It's not on him, boss. It's not here. Not here? Then where is it? Where's what? Oh, I am tired of your games. The scroll from the unicorn. A piece of paper like this. Saccharin has a similar scroll from his own model boat, but needs Tintins to help solve the riddle. But since Tintin lost it, Saccharin leaves him to rot. Well, until a furry someone sneaks on board. Snowy! <laughs> it's good to see you too. <laughs> see if you can chew through these ropes. <laughs> I wish I had a pet that resourceful. Can't even get this one to meow on cue. Not being one to just lie down and give up, Tintin escapes by tossing a makeshift grappling hook into an adjacent porthole. 
And this is how we meet Archibald Haddock, sea captain, alcoholic, and comedy relief. You're one of them. Sorry? They sent you here to kill me, huh? Look, I don't know who you are. Now that's how he's planned to bump me off. Murdered in my bed by a baby-faced assassin. Baby-faced assassin. Does anyone else think the writers are making fun of the animators? Haddock here is voiced by Andy Serkis. Circus did a lot of research on nautical life for this role and gave Haddock a Scottish accent, saying his character had a rawness, an emotional availability, and more of a Celtic kind of feel. I've been locked in this room for days with only whiskey to sustain my mortal soul. Oh. Well, I assumed it was locked. Well, it's not. The two work together to escape, with Tintin picking up the next clue in the Carabajan's radio room. The Sultanate of Bagar. Ruled over by Sheikh Omar Ben Salar, whose love of music and culture is matched only by his love of... Great snakes! <laughs> Tintin figures out that the ship is headed for the port of Bagar in Morocco and plots a course for it. He also radios the situation to the police, but gets cut off by the ship's crew, who are out to kill him. And this leads me to another criticism I have, but unlike the Uncanny Valley, this one's a little more... objective. Tintin is an impossibly good shot. <laughs> There's even a scene after they escape the Carabajan on a life raft when a plane from the ship comes to kill them. Bad news, Captain. We've only got one bullet. Hey, what's the good news? We've got one bullet. It's not like the movie really flaunts it, but this does seem like an easy out for the plot. Writers have to be very careful about not making their characters too perfect, or at least too skilled without reason. If Tintin had previous training, fine, but the movie hasn't established anything like that. This is probably my only real problem with the movie, and admittedly, it's not a huge one. It doesn't derail the plot or throw character motivation into question, but it does take you out of the moment, at least for a few seconds, and that's always something to look out for. Still, how cool was that line? We've only got one bullet. Hey, what's the good news? We've got one bullet. The plane is forced to land, and Tintin and Haddock take it over when it does. Tintin explains that he was aiming to be a pilot, and he reads a manual to start, so his being able to fly isn't quite like his unexplained marksmanship. Besides, he struggles with this part a bit more. Wonderful! <laughs> Did you think we might find another way to North Africa that doesn't take us through that wall of death? The plane pitches and stalls through the storm as Tintin struggles against harsh winds and an empty gas tank. This scene is really just here to show off the visual effects, though. And I'm okay with that. However, Tintin has had a climb onto the front of the plane to pour some spare alcohol into the gas tank to maybe get a few more miles. The alcohol that Haddock already drank. But as he's making his suicidal trek outside the plane, Haddock comes up with an odd, though clever, solution. We're running on fumes! Fumes! Okay, if that actually worked, then we would really have to start investing in frat boys as a fuel source. The fuel doesn't last as a problem, though, as the plane crashes into a sand dune. Captain, we have to be on the lookout for sandworms and shameless plugs. Oh god! There's one now! So Tintin and Haddock traverse the Saharan Desert, not sure where they're going, until Tintin witnesses a miracle. And to think, all it took was a day in the Sahara. Congratulations, Captain. You're sober. This change draws out Haddock's memory as he recalls an old family story that his grandfather told him. And to hell with your standard transitions, check this out! This would be a good time to talk about the transitions. You don't have just your simple jump cuts or a movie full of vertical swipes, I'm looking at you, Star Wars, but instead have these very clever changes using the surrounding environment to alter scene appearances. 
The result is fresh and very appealing. Just check this one out from later in the film. To bagar. To bagar. That there just comes off so very well. Obviously the books never had anything like this, so these are just another example of the care and attention the film crew put into the movie. Sometimes it really is the small things that make a difference. As his memory comes back to him, Haddock relives the final days of the unicorn through his ancestor, Sir Francis Haddock. What we get is a fight scene that is just over the top, but still fun enough to keep you fully engaged. Look, we even have one shipmast hanging from the other one and swinging like a pendulum. What you end up with is one of the most swashbuckling adventures you'll ever see. Combined with some very fitting music, the camera angles give us a dramatic run through the unicorn, including some unique combat moments you're not likely to see elsewhere. The pirates end up overwhelming the unicorn's crew, though, taking Sir Francis hostage and uncovering the unicorn's hidden cargo. The unicorn and Sir Francis's fate seem sealed. Sir Francis knew he was doomed. That he'd be hung from the highest yardarm. But they didn't reckon on one thing. Sir Francis was a haddock. And a haddock always has a trick up his sleeve. Sir Francis rigs the ship to blow, but not before engaging the pirate captain, Red Rackham, in a fight to the death. After another fight scene that follows a spark racing down a line of gunpowder, Sir Francis gets the winning blow in and reveals who Red Rackham really is. Saccharin's ancestor. Haddock's story just got a whole lot more personal. So, with newfound determination, Haddock and Tintin set off for the port of Bagar once again. In Bagar, our team runs into some suspicious characters following them in very stereotypical yet distinctive garb. What do you want? Why are you following us? Uh, who are you working for? Stop! Stop! Thompson and Thompson! Not so loud! Thompson and Thompson rejoin our heroes with good news. While Tintin was away, they tracked down the pickpocket and retrieved all the stolen wallets, including Tintin's, which still has the scroll inside. All they have to do now is retrieve the final scroll from the local ruler, Omar Ben Salad, then snatch Saccharin's scroll to complete the riddle. Unfortunately, Saccharin is one step ahead of them. The last model ship is on display behind a bulletproof glass that Saccharin plans to break through during an opera concert. Fans of the Tintin series will likely recognize Bianca Castafiore, a recurring character from the books. She sticks around for only a few minutes, but manages to get a few good lines in. We are blessed with your presence. Oh, yes, indeed, Senor Salad. What charming peasants. <laughs> However, during the concert, not only does Castafiore's voice shatter the protective glass and Saccharin's trained falcon grabs the scroll, but Saccharin's lackeys knock the good captain out and steal Tintin's scroll, meaning Saccharin has everything he needs to uncover the hidden location of the unicorn's wreckage. Now, before we go any further, I'm just going to step back for a moment and talk about cinematography and how well the movie pulls it off. Cinematography is much easier to achieve in animation than in live movies. You have total control over everything that happens in frame, like how wide the angle is, who and what are in frame, and where the camera hangs and travels. The cinematography in Tintin is always spot on, with close-up shots when needed, wide angle shots for grand scale, and the camera zooms around dramatically, giving us footage that would be difficult, if not nearly impossible to get with live action movies. Now, why do I bring this up? Because I consider the following chase scene to be one of the greatest examples of cinematography I've ever seen in my life. Saccharin and his men race back to the Carabajan with Tintin, Haddock, and Snowy hot on their trail. Haddock is even armed with an RPG, but when he fires it... Did you hit anything? Oh dear. And this becomes a chase scene that follows the scrolls as they pass between holders, between Tintin, Haddock, Snowy, Saccharin, and the Falcon. All parties race through the entire city all the way from the castle on top of the hills to the docks down below. Everyone has something to do and the action is smooth, intense, and gratifying. And for the bulk of the chase, this is all done in one single take. Again, that's easier to do since it's animation, but think of how much work had to go into designing this scene. They had to map out the city, 
keep track of where everyone was and how fast they could get there, how all the chaos Tintin and Saccharin were causing affected the city, and they made it last more than two and a half minutes. That takes a lot of effort, and I'll be damned if they didn't do a great job pulling it off. Animated or not, this scene is one of my favorites in all of cinema. Sadly, Haddock and Snowy are captured, and Tintin is forced to let the scrolls go in order to save them. Thompson and Thompson catch up with Tintin and Haddock, and a lot of them are able to track where Saccharin's going by the ship's radio signal, and they beat the Carabajan back home, where they all started. What the blaze is Nesta! Nesta! However, Saccharin won't go down without a fight, and jumps into a shipping crane to match the one Haddock is in, and soon begins the biggest sword duel you've ever seen. Okay, second biggest sword duel you've ever seen. When Haddock's crane is demolished, Saccharin steps out to finish him off in another sword duel, this one on a much smaller scale. Saccharin obviously has the upper hand, but threatens to burn the scrolls when the tides turn. Tintin helps put an end to that, though. Thundering typhoons. Nobody takes my ship. <laughs> Boy, I guess he really kicked that habit! <laughs> so with all three scrolls, Tintin and Haddock discover that the riddle reveals latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates which lead back to Marlin Spike Hall. Saccharin had taken the manor from the Haddock family, but now it seems the mansion may finally be returned to its rightful owner. Haddock leads Tintin and Esther the butler down into the cellar, where they find a statue with a globe. They pop open the globe and find Sir Francis's hat with an armful of gold, jewels, and treasure within it. And one more thing. Sir Francis left another clue at the bottom of the globe. A clue to what? 400 weight of gold. Just lying at the bottom of the sea. How's your thirst for adventure, Captain? Unquenchable, Tintin. And so the movie ends with a promise of a sequel. One that Spielberg and crew will hopefully be working on very shortly. <laughs> of all the nostalgia trips we've had in the run of remakes over the last few years, wouldn't you say that this was one of the best? I loved the books growing up. Tintin was one of the best escapes from reality when I was a kid. The Shooting Star, Destination Moon, Flight 714, all great books. They're set in a somewhat realistic world, with more than a few extraordinary things happening to Tintin and company. The art style is basic, but that just makes it more accessible to young readers, while still being detailed enough to keep adults interested. Going back over The Secret of the Unicorn specifically, I found that the story was much more simplistic than I remembered, but I guess that's the cost of looking into the past with rose-tinted glasses. If I have to give the book any criticism, it's that Tintin doesn't really have any flaws. It's something that was pointed out by Hergé as well. He's still a really fun character, though, and surrounds himself with flawed characters, so the problem's offset somewhat. I used to spend my entire weekend reading, then rereading Tintin. With 24 books in all, you could spend days reading and seeing the world alongside Tintin. Or, if you're an avid reader, a solid afternoon. The Adventures of Tintin and The Secret of the Unicorn gets a high 4 out of 5. Now I think I've made the case that I love the movie, too. It tells a solid, amazing story that you don't get too many of anymore. Adventure, action, comedy, drama, history, hell, throw in a romance subplot during a zombie invasion set in the Old West and you'll have covered almost every major movie genre out there. The pacing flows extremely well and each scene is addicting. While writing the script, I would rewatch scenes to study them further, only to notice a few minutes later that I had watched two or three scenes further than I intended. The characters are brilliantly written, standing out in their own ways. Had to get some of the best character development, going from a drunken sea captain running a stinking tub, tub, to a much more balanced adventurer who has a much better grasp over his alcoholism. I didn't talk about it much, but Snowy gets a few good scenes in as well. He doesn't get an inner dialogue like he does in the book, but you can still tell he's a very clever dog. The movie even includes several amusing jokes added into the background, bits that don't distract from the foreground and only serve to make those who are paying attention laugh. There are a handful of moments that are based more on childhood myths than real life, and they do distract somewhat given the realistic setting of the world, but given that it's a cartoon, we can forgive them. Some critics didn't like those scenes though, like the crane battle at the end of the movie, entirely forgetting that they were watching a cartoon! I'm really looking forward to the sequel. They say Professor Calculus is going to be in it, 
The Adventures of Tintin, The Secret of the Unicorn gets a well-earned 5 out of 5. This movie captured the idea of Tintin that I experienced all through my childhood. Tintin's bravery, persistence, and intellect were always his most appealing traits to me, and he was in rare form here. To me, as a child, Tintin was the very definition of badass, and you bet the movie kept that trend going. And it wasn't just the character that carried over well. Tintin's world wasn't simply copied from the book, it was improved upon. The original Tintin comics were actually somewhat tame by today's standards, so to keep up with a modern audience, the action and adventure had to be cranked up. And cranked up it was, with several exciting fight scenes, fantastic motion capture animation, and a musical score by the great John Williams composing for his first animated film ever. If I haven't stressed it enough, watch this movie, especially if you live in America. Tintin doesn't have as much of a presence in the States as he does in Europe, and that's something I hope to correct. If the popularity of the character and stories picks up, they might keep making movies. As an adaptation, Tintin gets a 5 out of 5. With all the remarkable characters, story, and nostalgia rolled into one, Tintin and the Secret of the Unicorn is perhaps the best movie that's appeared on this show yet. Isn't that right, Rain? Rain! Rain? Where the hell are you? Rain, you...